All right, thank you for joining another episode of Ungentrified. And I'm going to pause it right there for a second because before we get into today's topic, I want you to do a couple of favors for me. One, uh, I'm happy that you're here. And because you're here, I want you to do me a favor and tell other people that they should be here. So definitely share today's episode if you enjoy what we've discussed. And if you really enjoyed it, do me a favor, wherever you listen to podcasts, leave a review, leave some stars. Those are the things that help me immensely. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get into today's topic. One thing that I ask everybody that comes on this show, no matter who they are, is what's on their radar at the moment. And that could be something that's currently hot to you, your favorite thing, what's your jam at the moment, what book did you just finish reading, what Netflix hole have you fallen into, what's your what's your favorite thing right now, what's on your radar right now? I'm thinking about the rest of 2019, like, it's so many events coming up, like, how do we make sure we execute properly. So I'm thinking about something in the water concert, um, Broccoli City Festival. I'm thinking about prom season. So I'm just thinking about all the ways that's coming up next in 2019. Yeah, I, I'm i upset because I wanted to go to something in the water and, you know, saw the prices for VIP. And I was like, oh, that's not crazy for a three-day mm-hmm. festival. Went on there, I think... They went on sale on March 8th and went on there that afternoon. All the VIP tickets were gone. And I was like, man, already? So I'm hoping that maybe they release a couple of more because I was really trying to go. I thought it was dope. Um, but I don't know if that's going to happen for me now. I don't know if I want to do general admission for a music festival uh, at Virginia Beach. So I don't know. If anybody out there is listening and you want to slide your boy a VIP ticket, <laughs> I'm accepting all donations. But yeah, I was a little hurt by that. I was definitely trying to go at the end of April. But shout out to the East Coast. We about to be rocking, man. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a, a lot of festivals on the East Coast that are dope. Of course, you mentioned Rockley City. Uh, there's one Music Fest, which is in Atlanta in the fall, which is always uh, dope to hit. And it's growing each year, which is exciting to see. So yeah, there's definitely a lot to to do so you can bounce up and down the coast really from spring to summer and and hit uh, a couple of dope festivals Mm -hmm. let's Mm -hmm. see what's uh what's on my radar at the moment uh music wise i have been listening to uh snow allegra's new song which is uh pretty dope it's um what's the name of it uh i want you around so i'm hoping she's about to drop uh, another EP or album or something, but she's always consistent as far as music. I haven't been reading anything lately, which is a shame. Um, I, I felt like I was falling behind. I try to read at least one book a month, and I haven't touched anything mm. in March, so I'm slipping there. Uh, as far as Netflix, Netflix has been dry lately. Like Nothing popped up recently that I that I've been interested in. I think after um the the last uh thing I watched on there which was oh man it's slipping my mind the name of the documentary that I think everybody watched. Uh Sam <laughs> Cool. No, oh that I did definitely watch that one. That one was amazing. But no, it's uh oh man, what is the name of that documentary? It's about the guy who snatched up oh abducted in plain sight. That's it. So have you seen that yet? No, nah, I ain't seen that one. Yeah. Uh, it is... I, I am going to see that us, though. Oh, absolutely. So, okay, here's another reason why I'm upset. So, um, I signed up for a couple of advanced screenings for for us. Because I very rarely do I pay to go to the movies because it's mad expensive. I really got to be compelled to go. But a lot of times I'll do the advanced screenings because it's free. And you get to see the movie before everybody else. So, like a month ago signed up for one and then like two weeks ago signed up for another 
And I didn't get invited or passes to either one of them. So I actually got a step foot in the movie theater uh, on Friday when it comes out and and be with the masses. So I might try to hit like an early jump while while people are at work and folks at school. So I don't deal with the crowds because I know everybody and their mom is going to be trying to see it. And then mm-hmm. also, if any of my friends are listening, shame on y'all for not inviting me to the advanced screening that happened like on the 8th. Mad people I knew were at the screening at Atlanta and nobody told me about it. And it was separate from the ones that that I had signed up for. So if I see you in these streets and I knew you were there, I got a side eye for you. So yeah, I'll, I'll be a little upset because this is very, like I said, very rarely in my hype about a movie, but yeah, definitely in a chair somewhere in some movie theater on Friday watching that. So you guys are probably wondering who I've been chatting it up with about music festivals and movies for the last couple of minutes. So go ahead and tell the people who you are. Um, Julius Tillery, founder, owner of BlackCotton.us. We're a really trendy um, decor company. I'm a, also a cotton farmer, a black cotton farmer. You, re- you rarely get to speak and talk to them these days because we basically extinct. But um, family farmer, and I'm just doing my thing, trying to help my community by having a successful business, which is Black Cotton. So go follow us on Instagram. Go check us out online, blackcotton.us. And that's actually uh, why I brought Julius on today. Uh, as he mentioned, he is one of few. There are not too many black cotton farmers, let alone young ones. So uh, I wanted to to bring Julius on to give us a little insight into what his day to day is like and give us a peek into uh, black cotton as a business and as a, you know, a history. So. Tell us a little bit about the company Black Cotton and how it got started and, and where it's at today. Well, uh, the Black Cotton business basically started in 2016. Um, I was just working my career as an uh, agriculture advocate. Uh, I helped do a lot of outreach projects with farmers. So um, I was just working my job and also at the same time working as a um, as a farmer part time and I, I my family each year we do we raise cotton and soybeans and uh, you know I've been doing this for you know my whole life every year just raising these crops because we're not really making that much money so I start questioning I was like how can we make more money like my community also we like a really poor community as well you know uh, Northampton County is you know one of the poorest counties in the, in the state. So I just I always think like how can we make you know more money to make our area a little bit better. So um, I've been thinking about creative projects and I've done other things too. Like I've grown shiitake mushrooms. I started up for uh, a hunting lodge, but um, you know those things and that's fine and dandy too. But uh, what the black cotton thing is is it's been really beneficial because it's something that I can have a nationwide approach with. And uh, it's really been good because I've been getting love all over the nation with the business. So and I think that's what's going to be required for the business to grow to, you know, get to the goals we have. Right. And and you said that this the farming industry has been in your family for, for generations. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, it's a family farm. So it's been in my family uh, really six generations now. I'm a fifth generation uh, farmer. So, uh, but uh, it's been in our family since the early 1900s. So, um, and um, we're right in the same region where my family was born. Like, we've had, like, ancestry all the way back to slavery. Like, our last name is Tillery, and we're close to Tillery, North Carolina. And people from the area know our last name, know the people from the region, know that we're really connected to this area. Right, and and, and absolutely connected to, to the land. So has has Cotton always been in the Tillery family? As long as I know it, yeah, we're like a cotton region. Like in North, the state of North Carolina, we're the northeastern part of the state. Uh, our county and Halifax County, the Ronald Valley region, we're the number one and number two producers of cotton in the state. And that's where I'm pretty much from. And so it's always been like this. You know, we produce a lot of cotton. Do you know why your family went into cotton? Why, why that as a choice of crop? Well, that's just like the crop that people do around this area, you know, so... It's like if you're from Apple Valley, you're going to raise apples. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like the farmer region. It's like it's, it's a lot of that around there. So that's what people raise because it's the most convenient to raise. So what's the response you get from people when you tell them that you farm cotton? 
Well, I, I feel like the people in the area have a better understanding that understand why I raise cotton. Like, if you're from an urbanized area where you don't understand why people farm in general, then it might be shocking that I'm, I raise cotton. But for people who are from more rural, uh, you know, rural communities, they kind of understand the lifestyle of being a farmer. Like, it's just an industry. And it's other people that do it. But a lot of, like, uh, the black community has basically been doing a lot off of it because it's becoming really expensive and really hard for black farmers to maintain the capital it needs to be in farming. And that's a lot to do with changes in, in law, with government. And that's just scratching the surface. Of course, there's racial bias and and issues yeah. in, in that regard because you know you you've just told us you know you're from the one of the top two areas for producing cotton but yet it's also one of the poorest areas in in your state so that to mm-hmm. hear you know those two things at the same time kind of raises a brow like you know what could be going on but are there things that that black farmers deal with that other farmers don't have well, most black farmers don't have the access to capital that, like, you know, typically, you know, your larger farmers have. They can get better in tractors and they have more access to operating, uh, you know, operating funds. And most black farm, a lot of black farmers work a lot of other jobs just to be able to try to make ends meet or have benefits. And so it's like, it's not even just money, but it's time and, you know, opportunities, you know, opportunities to, to markets. Like, if you go in a grocery store and you see pictures of the farmers who had their produce in the stores, very rarely do you see a black farmer that they, that their produce is coming from that farm. Because black farmers make up a very small percentage of the grocery market. Not even a percentage. Or they're less than 1%. You're telling us that most black farmers, like, can't fully sustain themselves off of their own crops. Like, they have to get a side gig or something like that, which is, oh man, that's, it's frustrating to hear. Yeah. And I know a lot of the work that, that you're doing is to, to kind of counteract that. And, mm-hmm. and it, it just, we were just talking about like, you know, issues that black farmers deal with. And it, it reminded me of an article I saw maybe a few weeks ago about, and then when you mentioned that your family um, farms soybeans as well, I remember there was, I think it was Memphis where the black farmers just got uh, approval for their class action saying that they were sold fake seeds. Um, yeah. I don't know if you're yeah, familiar with that, but yeah, that I'm familiar with that case. Yeah. Um, like stuff like that to, to know that you're already dealing with, you know, your, your crops may not be able to financially sustain you. And then the, the money that you do put into it, it may not even produce anything because people are intentionally uh, selling you, you know, fake seeds or, uh, you know, bad soil or whatever it may be to prevent you from making what little money you could have made off of your crops. Uh, it's just crazy to think that this kind of stuff is still happening. And I don't even know if it's crazy. It's just it's frustrated to be reminded that these things are, are still mm-hmm. happening. So. Uh, your company's tagline is cotton is our culture, but as you yeah. and I both know, uh, the history of cotton is a touchy subject for the black community. So why do you think, Absolutely. why do you think that is? Why do you think that we still have a, a weird relationship with, with cotton? Well, it's really complicated, you know, because there's a, a slavery history of cotton and then there's a history of cotton right after slavery. And, you know, people relate a lot of stuff to slavery that wasn't slavery. But then it was really hard because of the institutions that were created through slavery and how we uh, we harvest cotton. Like, uh, I look at how we, you know, we raise cotton, how cotton just grows out of the ground. That's been like the same same type of way pretty much since back to slavery days, how we, we grow it up. But the way we harvest the cotton, um harvesters of cotton like the combines that wasn't created to the 1970s and once that pretty much came into you know popularity in the early 80s nobody picked hand-picked cotton no more so pretty much people stopped hand-picking cotton in 1980 but the same way that people hand-picked cotton from before 1980 all the way through slavery looked the same where people were just rushing through picking as much cotton as possible because they was trained to do that you know, like the way I harvest my cotton with my business is I take pruning shears and I cut the stalks down and then I put them in boxes. 
I don't hurt my hands when I when I harvest my cotton. Sometimes I say to myself, the whole history of how people even look at cotton would have been completely changed if it wasn't for old oppressors making black people machines, which is basically to hurt ourselves to try to pick as much cotton as possible. That is the history in short, you know, ramifications. But I'm changing how we look at this whole thing because I've been doing it for so long at the marginal, you know, price of doing it. That I have a better understanding of why things happen the way it is, and I know how to change them. And with you know un- the, the the deeper understanding that I have, and that's what I'm trying to bring to black cotton is not treating this cotton like just any cotton, but understanding the power and the creativity that black people possess in having ownership of this cotton. We never owned it, and that's what black cotton is doing. So you just kind of blew my mind uh, <laughs> in that answer. So you mean to tell me that? We didn't have like true technical advancement in cotton farming until the eighties, like the nineteen eighties, like thirty five, thirty six years ago. But once that happened, that's when everybody got out of the business. But uh, people have been picking cotton all the way up to that. So I'll say, every, right up to our parents' generation, people picked cotton, but it wasn't no money in it because it was it was the same harvesting plan from all the way to slavery. That's that's crazy. No creativity. Yeah. I mean, no, but but we always depend on white people just give us whatever they're gonna give us for cotton. I'm not doing that. That's the difference between me and like this is where the we gonna change the game at. That's the difference. You 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 brought a a great amount of history to cotton farming that I had no idea about, and I'm I wouldn't be surprised if. If those who were listening didn't know that as well, but thinking about the people who who had no idea, like me, have you gotten any flack from our community for the products that you've been selling? Because as you mentioned earlier, you you do a lot of decorative products with uh, mm-hmm. cotton. So knowing the history that that most people are familiar with, not not the one that you just blessed us with, but that most people are familiar with in our community, do they look at your products? in a in a different light or what's the response you get from that well because i'm so authentic and real once i educate most people of what's going on and re- their real history people who who can recognize real will be like okay that's the real thing I, I appreciate the knowledge but you know you have some people who are you know ignorant of their history their ancestors they, they just know what they've been seeing in on TV or what someone has told them from what something they may have read, or, but they don't know the truth about behind things. So they just make assumptions. Those people, they can think whatever, you know what I'm saying? And, and sometimes that happens, but typically when I show people the real, and let them understand they, the truth, they have a better understanding and a better, deeper appreciation. Yeah. And, and I think, and I, well, I hope rather that our community is getting a little bit better as far as knowing what what black farmers go through. And like I said, we have shows on TV like Queen Sugar now, which kind of gives a new light to the the black farmer industry that, that, that hadn't been there before. But in the end, that's TV. So we know that, you know, things are glossed over. Some things aren't said. It makes it look much more <laughs> fancier than... Can I, keep, can I keep it real with you? Yes, please. Okay, so I know one of the families that is that's really down there that's suffering through the issues they show on the TV show. Mm-hmm. That's right down there suffering through things. Their farm was about to be foreclosed this year. They had to raise $50,000, right, to save their farm. And they did do GoFundMe. But do you know that the people from Black, um, from Queen Sugar act, still act like they don't know that they exist? And it's like, that's one of the shameless things because, like, people can portray things, but they Hollywood. They don't care about what's really happening. It's It's terrible. That you can just portray something and then ignore what's really happening right in front of you. Yeah, that's disappointing to hear that. But that that really brings me to to the question: Is there something that you wish the rest of the black community knew about you know black farmers and black land ownership that that doesn't get shown on TV or in the media? What what would that be? That we exist, but it's difficult for us to compete because we don't have the same type of access to money. That's it. And then we also black, so we go through black people issues. You know what I'm saying? Farming is real complex and uh, complicated, and you know, money helps with a lot of issues, and we just never have that type of money. 
So, so what's the best way for for us to support black farmers, or in your case, black cotton? What's the best way for for us to to support? Well, I mean, we'll be, like with these conversations, and we can be educated on real things. That's when we can start making better decisions. Like, and I, I appreciate your uh, the opportunity to speak on your platform because black people, how we spend our money is important. Like, if if we decide for one holiday season we're not going to spend money at Walmart, we're going to spend it with black businesses that we know. That changed that black business and that money stays in your community. Like we have that power, we just need to exercise it more. And I think media platforms just like this is a, a, a allows us to understand how we can communicate to be able to work together better and make better consumer decisions. Because I too want I, I challenge myself to even buy more from black businesses. Yeah, uh, in the work that I do uh, with, with my company, Black and Abroad, we're very intent on supporting Black businesses everywhere we can. Like that is the first place we we go. We ask a question, like, okay, if we want to, you know, pull off X, Y, and Z event or trip. What Black businesses can we support in doing so? And it's you know just making that conscious effort to be like, hey, the first place I'm going to go is is here versus uh everywhere else that alone can make a world of difference because for a lot of things that we do there are viable black businesses out there that can provide the service or uh or the the need in in any way shape or form so but it takes us being willing to to put that question first like well, where you know where is that business? How can I find that business? You know, what's the work I need to do to work with that business? Because a lot of times it isn't anything more than just asking the question. And somebody's willing to give you the answer as to where to find that business and to make it happen. But yeah, it's, it's something that I strive really, really hard to do. And, you know, in some cases, it is incredibly hard. We've been just, for example, for us, we've been trying to find in the, the locations that we take people to black owned hotels. In one of our trips, we have one, so that was you know a, a blessing. But it's it's been really hard to to find that. Um, but you know where we can, we use black tour guides, black restaurants mm-hmm. to patronize, or uh, mm-hmm. if it's not black owned, they have taken the appreciation and and not only the quality of work that a person does. Like there's a restaurant that we use. In Cartagena, it's not black owned, but the head chef is a young black chef. When we talk about black business, so let's be specific. When we in Atlanta, we got to go to 640 West Cafe. You know, shout out to them. You know, so, you know, everybody can know. So what's your brother's name? In Cartagena, his name is uh, Wilbur. So uh, Wilbur is the head chef of Bohemia, which is a five star, you know, restaurant in the center of the wall city young dude super creative has put together an amazing menu and you know infuses his afro-caribbean background with uh the the items on the menu but definitely if you're in cartagena stop by bohemia and get a taste of his food but there are plenty of black owned businesses in cartagena to support as well Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we we take a group down there is because we know we can put as much money into black communities wherever they may exist in that place. So yeah, definitely check out uh, Wilbur at Bohemia. But yeah, I, like, I could rattle off a whole bunch of <laughs> places in Atlanta that uh, are worthy of support and that I, I frequent on a regular basis. So yeah, we we definitely need to make conscious efforts to to go first uh, and make that the first choice when we can. That's right. Julius, before... Uh, I'll let you go. Tell the people where they can find out more about Black Cotton and and what's the best way they can put money in your uh, community's pockets. Well, uh, definitely follow me on Instagram at at blackcotton.us and you can go to the website www.blackcotton.us. Please just shoot me a message. uh, If you see me on either one, um, I'll respond back. You definitely should want to decorate with black cotton because our catchphrase is when you decorate with black cotton, anything is possible. One thing about our gifts is when you get one, you're not going to throw it away. You know, it's it's stuff you get for each holiday season that you just get from Walmart. You're going to throw away like two weeks later. 
the, when you get one of these cotton gifts, they're going to last forever. And then whoever gets is not going to throw it away. So it's a deeper gift. And if people can look us up and see the connection we have with the community, with the land. It's in a black rural community, in a black, old abandoned black school of an office I'm in right now speaking to you all. So we're just giving back to our community and keeping it real. Yes, I appreciate that. And definitely uh, hit up Julius at the website and on Instagram and, and do what you can to support. Of course, I appreciate you guys and your ears for listening and supporting me. And as I have mentioned before, I would love if you shared today's episode or any episode that has uh, perked up your ears and caught your attention. Of course, if you're on Apple Podcasts, you can leave a review. Some stars is nice, but a written review is even better. And you can follow Ungentrified on both Instagram and Twitter at Ungentrified Pod. And you can learn more about the podcast and all of the other episodes if this is your first time here at UngentrifiedPodcast.com. Julius, brother, I appreciate you coming through and blowing my mind with uh, some history on our connection to the cotton industry and black farmers in general and I'm glad to have you, man. I'm glad to be with you all. All right, and I'll check everybody next time. Peace.